We recently came across a most curious artifact, one which has been claimed as having once been found, just like a handful of other exquisite objects we have previously shared, within a lump of ancient coal. It is a once smelted, solid iron recreation of a face, whose owner could have lived an unimaginably long time ago. With the claim written by John D. Morris, PhD, quote, I was recently contacted by an older lady who grew up in the coal mining area of Appalachia. Her ancestors, having lived in the area for generations, her now deceased father was a miner who had once made a remarkable discovery embedded within a coal seam, a human face made from cast iron. Like most people, they had been taught that coal is far too old to contain any human artifacts. The miner was so proud and perplexed by his find, it eventually became a family heirloom and was simply named Man. As a large, heavy object, it was eventually used as an ornament, decades later becoming stored among his belongings. She distinctly remembers her father's story of its discovery and the care he had taken with this prized object, having recently rediscovered it among her father's possessions." End quote. The owner of this artifact has requested to remain anonymous and to withhold her identity. This makes the story even more appealing to us, as throughout our time researching these types of claims, and indeed artifact, we find that those who are pushing a supposed discovery publicizing themselves while touring an object, are often in a search for a profit and recognition. Thus, as she is seemingly fearful of the artifact's disappearance, it would seem her story would align more with someone who possesses an item, not only of an extraordinary, incredibly controversial age, but also has a sentimental value, one which outweighs any idea of selling the item or even risking losing it from exposing its location. How old is the so-called man? Who could have made it, pouring cast iron into a mold, resulting in an exact duplicate of the man's face in the form of a three-dimensional mask? Could we be peering at the face of an ancestor, once of incredible importance? One from a lost civilization, a lost time within our planet's history? we find such possibilities incredibly intriguing. Known as the Kola Superdeep Borehole, it was a Soviet engineering project that occurred from the late 1960s to the early 1990s. Going to a depth of 40,000 feet, operations on the site ceased after they reached unbearable heat levels as they predictably got closer and closer to the Earth's superheated molten core. It is known as the deepest hole on Earth and long held the title as the deepest hole humans had ever dug. A test in machinery's capabilities and to see how far into the Earth they could bore before they were inevitably turned away from unbearable heat. Yet, interestingly, although this borehole is located on a remote peninsula in northern Russia, thus making it a very minimal danger to human life. It was hurriedly sealed up after a fossil was found, reportedly at 40,000 feet deep within our Earth's mantle. The drilling operation reportedly went through a layer of ancient plankton, which brought up life forms dated at 2.5 billion years old. The question is, what was this fossil? Why would rumors circle that that is the reason for sealing this borehole? when sealed even though it presented no real danger to anyone. Why would sites such as Snopes get involved in trying to discredit these claims? There are many things within modern historical understanding which have been born out of another area of history, which was, unfortunately, built upon an initial faulty foundation, this often being timelines and an ignorant lack of awareness of ancient high technology. So, if something arises which casts doubt on these areas of teaching, it can have a catastrophic effect on other areas of academia. Thus, this would indeed give motive to cease any such operations and to hastily stonewall 
or in this case, seal any access to the location, thus covering up any further discoveries. What was found within the Kola Superdeep Borehole? We find the possibilities highly compelling. One of the more obscure and personal favorite uparts of mystery history is a small yet incredibly special unique figurine. Dated to the Stone Age, yet regardless of this extraordinary antiquity, this hollow figurine remaining unopened and unbroken for so long, interestingly, rattled. After a delicate extraction procedure was undertaken, a metallic ball was found inside. A sphere, which due to the aforementioned age of said upart, should simply not exist. Yet, after further research, we have discovered that this unique figure wasn't a singular anomaly as we first presumed, but was actually part of a collection of equally puzzling artifacts, some of equally unexplainable characteristics. We now know it was found amongst a collection by locals mining for gold in Sierra Leone. They are now known as the Nomaly figures. The statues are now attributed to a number of varying legends in Sierra Leone. Dating from 17,000 BC, some believe that angels who once lived in the heavens were, as a punishment for causing bad behavior, turned into humans and sent to Earth a legend uncannily similar of certain fallen angel theories. The anomaly figures are thusly thought to serve as representations of those entities, and were cast as a reminder of how they were banished from the heavens to earth to live as humans. There are many strange hybrid interpretations within the collection. It includes animals such as monkeys, elephants, lizards, among other curiosities, some also depicted as giants. Quote, While the figures are varied in shape and time, they are uniform in appearance, indicative of a common purpose. That purpose remains unknown, however. The figures were part of a Temni culture and tradition, but that, upon invasion by the Mendi, the tradition was lost and the civilization displaced to other locations. With so many questions and uncertainties, it is unknown if we will ever have definitive answers as to the dating, origins, and purpose of the anomaly figures. For now, they remain a magnificent representation of the ancient civilizations that preceded those that now live in Sierra Leone." End quote. Asserted curator Frederick Lamp. We find the entire collection especially our previously covered Upart's metallic sphere, highly compelling. We have in the past covered the astonishing ancient high technology still present within the gas-filled lens of Nineveh. Along with this proof of an ancient civilization's knowledge of glass blowing and convex lens making, there is seemingly many more examples that have quietly been found, studied, and pushed into the archives of museums worldwide, in particular those found within the ancient sites upon Crete. Although many a sleuth has discovered this fact and have subsequently investigated these claims and indeed proofs of an ancient civilization's astute awareness and past ability at creating these perplexing reading lenses, lenses of a surprisingly high quality, the first exposure of this truth came from a most unlikely of sources, that being the July issue of the British Journal of Physiological Optics in 1930, which contained a communication from a Mr. H. L. Taylor in, quote, The Origin and Development of Lenses in Ancient Times, which ascribes the development of the lenses to the Cretans of 1800 BC. His examination of the museums of the Eastern Mediterranean has led him to the conclusion that ivory and steatite, the materials used for beads prior to 2000 BC, later replaced with rock crystals, onyx, agate, and cornelian. The discovery of the magnification produced by a bead of rock crystal, he believes, led to the production of lens-shaped beads and eventually of lenses such as those of the Royal Gaming Board found in the palace at Knossos, the best of which 
now rest within the archives of the museum Candia within Crete. Their magnification ability has been recorded at between 5 and 8 diopters and are plano convex in shape. These quality lenses were then transported out of the area to the mainland, including Troy, Tyre, Nineveh, and the United Kingdom." End quote. However, any explanation as to how these ancient artifacts were indeed created remains unknown, or indeed untold. The closest anyone dare tread is claiming they are of natural rock crystal origins and developed accidentally. Regardless, their existence is undeniably highly compelling. We have, in the past, explored the incredible discovery of the mythological animal sculptures of Persepolis, now known as the Lamassu. We detailed the difficulty involved in transporting just a single example of one to London a mere century ago. Yet, it would seem a similar situation seemingly also occurred at the ancient site of Amethyst, one in which the French quietly endured and restrictively documented. Located east of Agio Tyconis, next to Limassol in southern Cyprus, strategically commanding a stunning view of the surrounding Mediterranean landscape, the main acropolis of Amethyst, sitting just out of reach of the tourist track, atop the hill above. This location served also as an additional natural fortification for the site and its ancient observatory. Impressive discoveries have been made at the ruin, including ancient basins, vases, and various other utensils used by past inhabitants of varying eras. Atop the hill were two giant vases decorating the entrance to the main temple, one once dedicated to the god of love Aphrodite, each of which being 1.85 meters tall and weighing an immense 14 tons each. One of which being stolen by the French, specifically architect Edmond de Thoit, during the Ottoman occupation of Cyprus, supposedly given permission to take it away to his country. It now rests in the Louvre Museum in Paris. His documentation of this ordeal, we feel, is a revealing insight into the clear prohibition from exposing the astonishing capabilities of ancient civilizational capability. He reservedly wrote of the ordeal of getting it back to Paris in his diary. Quote, Our last day was dedicated to Amethyst, the only sanctuary of Aphrodite that we visited. There, we found two huge stone vases 3.4 meters in diameter. I could not figure out the amount that was buried in the ground, and only a measure of the artifact which was sticking out. I thought if I managed to get it out of there and to convey it into the sea, it will be my biggest achievement. I will begin to study the ways and mechanisms needed to achieve this and to have it transferred. This will create a big impression in the Louvre." End quote. Who made these vases, or indeed the Acropolis itself? They were clearly astonishing vases, having existed to this day and beyond, and along with their sheer weight, we undoubtedly find them highly compelling.